welcome everyone. We are about to get started. So thanks everybody for coming out again tonight. This is our fourth Startup Grind event. Great to have you all here. Nice to see all you faithful people here who've been here week after week and uh, nice to have you first timers here tonight also. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, our, um, our fireside chat guest. Steve Check. Steve and his wife, Janine, are the owners of Empyrean Technologies, a local provider of IT services to the small and medium-sized businesses throughout the Lower Mainland. And Steve is the acting CEO of the company. Steve and his wife, Janine, have been partners for 12 years. I think they've been married longer than that, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> About three times that. Okay. They've been business partners for 12 years and have grown the company to 21 employees servicing some of our region's largest companies. Imperial successes can be attributed to having three clear goals and building a culture that attracts and retains employees for the long term. And BC Business Magazine listed their company, Imperial Technologies, as one of the top 100 fastest growing companies in BC. So let's welcome Steve Check, please. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. It's yeah. great to have you here, yeah. Steve. Hey, before you start asking me a bunch of questions, yes. I was talking to Mel before, and I realized that he's never been a speaker at Startup Grind before, and I thought that maybe we could have a show of hands as to who, or, you know, who's in favor of Mel maybe telling his story sometime, too, you know? So, oh, well, uh, it's very kind of yeah, you to put your so hands I'll, up. I'll nominate him. Yeah, he's, always, <laughs> he's always picking my brain as to, hey, you got, got to help okay. me find some speakers, so... I'll nominate you. Okay. And, and John you. Lanstra, too, you know. John Lanstra, too. Okay, yeah. wonderful. John, yeah. we will talk about this, all right? So, Great. Thank yeah. you, Steve. Yeah. So, Pre jo so John and I go back a long way. Yeah. We were best man in each other's wedding. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, that is, that is long time it's a little while. It's a little, a little while, while, yeah. yeah. A few years ago. 1980. Wonderful. That's a, that's a yeah. cool connection. Wonderful. Well, so, Steve... Yes. Uh, other than the um, the lovely introduction I gave for sure. you, why don't you tell us about Steve Check? Tell us about little Steve <laughs> growing up. <laughs> tell us about Steve. There's not much of a story. There. Oh, come uh, okay. on. Well, I basically I grew up in a military family. Uh, my dad uh, f um, served about 31 or two years in the military. So we, we were one of these families that didn't get moved around a lot. So mm. pretty stable, you know, spent... Uh, 10 or 11 or 12 years in Ontario, and then he got posted out here. That's how we ended up here. So uh, come from a military background. I'm the youngest of four kids and the only boy, so mm. I'm the perfect one that my sisters always say, right, because I could do no wrong, you mm -hmm. know. Those who mm -hmm. have a lot of girls in their family probably understand that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, pretty normal childhood, sports, uh, fishing, running around in the woods, um, all that kind of stuff. Okay, great. So what did you, you, you mentioned fishing and that sort of sure. thing. And so you were in Chilliwack around, well, I don't know if I can ask you the year, but you were, in the, you were in Chilliwack when there was a lot of fish in the river, I'm sure. Yeah, I've, well, I've been here 40-some uh, years, so I've uh, okay. seen that oh, throughout the years for sure, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you come from a military family, yeah. and what was school like for Steve Check? Um, that's probably the bad part of my childhood. You won't, don't really want to hear, but I wasn't really that great of a student or anything. Uh, mm. Liked more playing sports and chasing girls and, you know, typical uh, rebellious young teenage age after that. And, uh, yeah, um, pursued the arts, construction, building stuff, more of those type of activities okay. in school. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for that. Did you have any indications, any clues that you might have some entrepreneurial uh, rumblings within you? You know, I just so you guys know, these questions are all staged, right? Like we've already talked about, <laughs> about all this. We, we kind of have. So I've actually been thinking about it for a few weeks about that because really you think about where does your entrepreneurial spirit come from? Were you born with it? Like, did you learn it? Like, mm -hmm. like where did it come from, right? Uh, where, you know, is it God ordained? Like whatever, whatever your, your vibe on life is, mm -hmm. like you might think about that. And I've been actually thinking about that quite a bit. And, you know, my dad, because in the military – especially, you know, your rank dictates your salary and you work hard and you get mm. your salary, whether you work 
two hours or 80 hours, right? Okay. But he always did other things. And I was just thinking about that. You know, he would pick fruit. Uh, as kids, we'd go down the highway and pick bottles, and we, he'd let us have the money, you know, and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, even when we moved out to BC in the early 70s, he did stuff like that where, you know, he would always take me along and we'd go. I remember one time we would started a, or we sold blueberries in the um, drive-in theater. It used to be like a farmer's market on Saturdays or something okay. for somebody who knew how to blueberry farm. So there was that, you know, so getting involved in that kind of thing. And then when I was about 13 or 14, and my first real job was as a swamper for Money's Mushrooms. We used to load mushroom crates onto a truck mm-hmm. with a guy and mm-hmm. leave home at four at night and go all around the valley to all the mushroom farms and pick up mushrooms till, you know, four in the morning. It was just crazy, but I really liked it. I, mm. I, I learned to work hard, right? And I think that a lot of those attributes came through those experiences as a kid, like yeah. not realizing it at the time, but looking back, mm-hmm. I think that's really, because I didn't do well in school. I'm actually a high school dropout. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't go to university, like all these things. I didn't learn yeah. it, you know, through book learning necessarily. Yeah. But I, I think just the idea of working hard and there's a reward. Yeah. I think that's really, um, you know, what I would attribute my, you know, that to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that story. And I know, you know, you mentioned high school was challenging for you. And I think, you know, um, for a lot of us who maybe don't have a, a higher education, become a, have become entrepreneurs, it's an, it's an encouraging story, your story, Steve. So if you don't mind me asking, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about it. Because, because you've clearly done very well despite that. And it's a good story to hear. Yeah, well, okay. Um, I mean, I think that... You know, if you zoom forward to where I am now, the way I got here was by putting my head through a windshield in a head-on collision. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting way to, you know, get into business, right? I don't recommend it necessarily. Like, you know, I worked the first 10 or so years of my adult life in construction. Um, you know, I the last part of that as a as a siding installer. So, you know, you get paid piecework. So there's an entrepreneurial side to that where, because mm-hmm. you only get paid by the amount of square feet, right? And I did really well at that. And uh uh, it used to really bother some of the new guys that started out because, you know, at two o'clock I'd go home, I'd made my 200 bucks or my 250 bucks and I'm going home and they're like, man, I just, you know, I'm working on my first box, which at the time was worth like 28 bucks or something, right? I just mm-hmm. developed a system of, and, and, and again, the idea of working hard and figuring out a system and, you know, you could just make things happen fast. And uh, so that uh, is what I was doing. Got off work, went on a fishing trip up to Foley Lake. Anybody knows the area there? It's a nice little lake. My brother-in-law threw a bush road, came around a corner, head-on collision with a four-wheel drive vehicle and you know, busted the windshield with my head. Woke up in a, a crumple on the floor and that was my start into getting out of construction. So that's really my, the start mm. of my, my, my journey into I, the IT world. Um, basically, uh, the short story is I got retrained by ICBC as a COBOL programmer started working in the industry in 1989, May 1989, mm-hmm. started punching out COBOL code and, you know, uh, payroll and accounting programs for a small company in Vancouver. And that was kind of my entry into the IT world. I see. I see. So, so you were forced out of construction by an accident. Yeah. Or I was released from construction by, okay. <laughs> by, by an accident. You know? It was something, you know, like anybody who's about my age and, and remembers the eighties, you know, the housing market, construction market was really challenging. Right. And I think, you know, if you ask John, when he tells the story, I mean, he got into the shoe business in the eighties as well, you mm-hmm. know, cause we, we used to work together in construction at one time. Right. The eighties was super challenging, housing bubble, the high interest rates, all that kind of stuff. So anybody in the construction industry is really tough mm. to just even like keep food on the table. You know, we were married, we had little kids, you got to feed them. Shoes are expensive, especially if you buy them at Peyton and Buckle, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and so, you know, you just did what you did, right? So, um, mm. um, you know, our, our goal really, and a lot of discussions, I think through the you know, mid part of the eighties, like I got to do something different. That, mm. that was really, you know, and so for us, you know, uh, like you're just praying for a miracle, like something like, a, you know, a job to fall from the sky or the next opportunity or whatever. For me, it was actually putting my head through a windshield, which really from where I sit today, looking back was a godsend, really. 
because mm. otherwise I'd still be out on the side of a building somewhere banging siding or doing roofing or, you know, in the fall. Imagine how much fun that was, right? It wasn't much mm -hmm. fun. So mm -hmm. so that's how I got into the IT world. You know? okay. okay. I always tell people that's kind of why I am <laughs> the way I am, you know. It's kind of a bad joke, but... Uh, <laughs> It is, it is the truth, right? Mm -hmm. it, I really attribute that accident to who I am today, yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, thanks for that. So it is really quite a story. So if, when you think back on that day, do, do you, if you hadn't had that accident, where do you think life would have taken you? Uh, good, really good question. You know, like uh, I'd probably still be, I don't know, maybe I'd be a Chilliwack's biggest contractor or something. I don't know. I'd probably don't have that, wouldn't have had that mindset, but you know, I, I would I would work probably towards something like that. I would imagine mm. I'd be working the construction trades probably still, or yeah. I don't know, selling real estate, you know, competing with Cam or you know something, yeah. right? You know, yeah. something like that. I would think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so so continue on with the story. You get you get you get uh, retrained because yeah. you're not going back to the construction site. Right. ICBC offers to retrain you. Yep. And you enter the IT world. So yeah, basically, I uh, started attending uh, some schooling. Uh, the interesting part, side side note to the story, I, I took a computer programming course, which required me to have high school graduation in order to actually attend that program. But about um, three, we yeah, three weeks before I actually had that accident, I actually wrote my GED. Mm. So kind of an interesting story, right? And being the lazy school kid that I was, like with the GED, they did classes and there's four exams and you have to pass them all, right? So, mm -hmm. but I decided that I wasn't gonna study. I thought I would be easier to write the exams and then I'll study the one or two or three or hopefully not four that I'd fail. That was my <laughs> approach to life. So, you know, the shortcut. Mm -hmm. So luckily I, I just, I passed it on the first kick. So I didn't have to study for it. I just wrote, went and wrote the exam. So don't recommend you do it, <laughs> but it, it is possible, right? Must have been all that extra wisdom you you got after leaving high school that just made it easy for you. I, I guess so. School hard knocks or something. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Great. And so you you get retrained and you go out into the workforce. Sure. Some interesting things happen. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, basically I worked for a number of small companies uh, through, you know, up until about 1993, bounced around from jobs here and there a little bit, uh, trying to find my way. Um, in uh, 93, I actually just saw an ad in the paper for a, uh, computer guy for a company called First Heritage Savings Credit Union, which is now Envision Financial, applied for that job. And actually out of around 250 applicants, I got that job. So uh, mm -hmm. that's how I kind of got more into the commercial IT market. I, I got uh, started working in the credit union system. Uh, a lot of experience, obviously, over the next six and a half years, building their network and Mm. new branches and moving infrastructure and uh, all that kind of stuff. It was, uh, it was actually a very uh, challenge, super challenging experience, but very rewarding. So I think a lot of my, um, you know, what I, what I do today, I can kind of attribute back to that experience, a lot, quite a lot mm -hmm. of it for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you were living in Chilliwack and driving to Vancouver? Or no, driving to Habitsford. Habitsford, yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. And you finished up there and you moved on to something else that wasn't Vancouver, yeah. didn't you? Uh, yeah, so uh, year 2000 came, you know, the big uh, world's going to blow up scare we had. And uh, Y2K. Uh, uh, Y2K, I remember that. No, nobody does because it was a non-event. But uh, uh, there's a company, well, it's a, a company is now Telus, but there was a, a, another IT company called ISMBC, which basically managed its infrastructure for most of the largest company in, in companies in BC. So, you know, BC Gas and, mm -hmm. you know, Scott Paper and, uh, you know, Dairy World and all these kind of corporations. And uh, so I actually worked for them leading up to Y2K on Y2K remediation projects. So that's re server replacement, migrating from legacy systems. Uh, I think I was in 18 sites in 16 months, 18 mm -hmm. different projects in 16 months. It was just a whirlwind of activity that uh, uh, also gave me some interface into, you know, the bigger business world, how things are done and mm. structure of companies and all that kind of stuff. So uh, again, another part of my education, I guess you could say, right? Mm. Hmm. Yeah, a, a, an amazing story from a head-on collision out in the woods to, to this. Uh, you know, hear, hearing that story at... Um, there's got to be some great lessons in there when life throws you a curveball. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm wondering if you might, if you 
Yeah, I'm sure you've thought about this since I have, that happened actually, yeah, many, sure. many years ago. And I wonder if you could share something about, about what you've been thinking about that. Well, you know, I think the number one thing is like when life does throw you a curveball, curve is like, get up. You know, and it's, it's, it's maybe a, a pat phrase or whatever, but it's really the truth, you know, like whether, like that was a serious event. I come home, you know, my wife has uh, got a, a baby under the arm and one in the oven and, and uh, you know, I've got a neck brace on and I can't work and mm. we just moved into a brand new house and, and all these kinds of things, right? So huge mm. curveball, what are you going to do, right? Well, that's a big, big event. But, you know, even as entrepreneurs, we face challenges every day, right? So just mm. sometimes we just got to put our feet on the floor and get out of bed, right? And mm. do whatever it is we have before us that we can do because, you know, life throws a lot of challenges, right? So I yeah. think uh, yeah. perseverance, like mm -hmm. in spite of good, bad, or others, is, is really a good trait to teach yourself or to learn. That would mm -hmm. be one thing that um, I, I've learned through that experience. Uh, another thing I think because I worked in a lot of large corporations and you know, obviously with different supervisors and different types of managers is really, uh, I think one of my life lessons from all of that is how not to treat people. Mm. Um, I've worked with a lot of jerks, for lack of a better word, uh, people that didn't treat employees properly and, yeah. and whatever. So I think, you know, the, the human side of interaction with people, um, I think a lot of that I, I learned by observing in, in those environments for sure. Mm. Yeah. You learned what not to do. Well, I know I learned what yeah. I didn't like. So then yeah. it became like, huh. you know, if I don't like it, why should I treat people that way? And then you try and, you know, Mm -hmm. put that into everything you do, right? Like mm. treat people the way you want to treat them and, and all those kinds of things, right? So yeah, yeah. in spite of difficult situations, I mean, the IT world can be super, super hectic. Yeah. There's a lot of high stress situations at times, like things are broken, they don't work. A lot of people sit around twiddling their thumbs because I, you know, you're the guy, right? So those can be very tense situations, right? So you can mm. choose to mm. yell and scream, rant and rave, punch walls, whatever you want, or you mm. can just, you know, find a way to deal with the situation, right, mm. and, and the and the personalities and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, so I'd be interested to hear more about that. How do you handle tense situations in the <laughs> IT world when things are broken and things are just not working? How, how do you handle that? Now or before? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell us both. And, and what changed? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, obviously, it's I mean, I have, my today. company is a bit bigger. Yeah, so I do zero hands-on IT anymore, right, yeah. and. You know, as as a leader, you always want to replace yourself, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, all the things I used to do when I first started out, you know, like calling, you know, smaller company, you, you do everything. You used to do the books, you used to scrub the toilet, you used to, you know, do the sales, you used to do everything. So as you grow, obviously, you learn to, to trust people to do those things, right? Mm -hmm. So now... Um, you know, honestly, the honest answer, if there's a big stressful situation, I let my service <laughs> manager deal with it, believe it or not. And it might seem harsh, but that is that is the reality of my life right now. So okay. For the most part, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm the second line of defense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have, have a service manager that deals with all those types of situations with yeah. customer issues and whatever, and, and I get involved as I need to. So for the most part, he does a great job. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I don't have a lot of opportunities where I got to jump in and save the day, you know, so mm. to speak, you know, put some direction maybe towards certain situations and, and that's about it. So, mm. so your service manager, he must have gleaned something from working with Steve check. Uh, I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, he's been there 10 years. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you mentioned in the bio that, you know, we've tried to hire for, for, you know, the right, good employees and for long term. Mm. uh, you know, that's uh, something we spend a lot of time doing, right? trying to find the people that fit our culture, yep. that can thrive within the culture we have. Um, you know, as people that prof profess faith, we run our business with that, and but we don't necessarily just hire people of faith. We hire anybody that has a skill set that can thrive within our environment, yep. that can, um, you know, work uh, towards what our goals and visions as a company are, mm -hmm you know, that can treat the customers the way that we want to treat them and, and all those kinds of things. So um, uh, I can't remember where I was going with that thought, but. Uh, mm. Okay, okay. Owning a business in Chilliwack and attracting talent, as you say. We could talk a little bit about that because we have talked a little sure. bit about it. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it can be a challenge by the sounds of it from time to time. 
Well, I think the tech world in general is just a challenge, not just here. I mean, there's obviously, you know, we're next to a big metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. You know, big companies recently have moved into a big metropolitan area and gobbled up all the, let's call them the top talent. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as a small <clears throat> company trying to find the right pieces, you're always struggling with, well, I can go to work in Vancouver for what you're offering me plus X. Mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with that. And I actually, I think I was talking, what was it called? Somebody earlier I was talking about this idea, like I always thought that with the housing market the way it's been and, you know, the, and, uh, people being driven out of the city farther and farther out, that filling the tech need here would be actually easier. But, you know, we, a recent hire that we've done, I mean, we went through 58 people and didn't hire any of them. Because uh, they chose somewhere else? or No, because they didn't meet what we were looking oh, for, see, right? I so, see, see. Uh, you know, we're looking for a combination of attributes and hum human attributes and, and skills and, and abilities, obviously. But, you know, attitude is a huge, huge part of it. Like skills, you can teach somebody, but attitude, you can't. So mm -hmm. if they have a bad attitude, even if they've got top skills, like we don't really want them. We'd rather have somebody with a great attitude and mediocre skills mm -hmm. because we can teach them to do things the way we like to have them done. And, and we want to make sure that, you know, they can show, they're going to show up for work every day and they're going yeah. to enjoy working, they contribute to the team and, mm. you know, uh, promote our values as a company and, and all those kinds of things, right? Okay, okay. Do you have, have a, clearly you have a strategy in the interview stage to discover if they have a, what sort of attitude they have. I, <laughs> I'd be interested to hear how, how, that's, how that might be done. And what sort of, what sort of attitudes do you hear? Um, okay. I mean, it's, it's the millennial thing, I don't know if that plays, no, a, it's a, challenge plays sure. a role in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, our process is really we put out a resume trying to, excuse me, identify, you know, the skill set we're looking for. We get resumes. We vet the resumes. If there's somebody that has skill sets and not a sketchy employment history. Mm. Uh, in our world, I think I mentioned, I can't remember, I was talking to somebody earlier tonight. You know, you get a resume, it's 17 pages, and the guy's had a new job every month. It's like, oh, I don't think I necessarily want that guy unless he's just been doing contract work. You got to mm -hmm. try and figure that out maybe. But so, you know, you look at that, we actually send out about a 15 question questionnaire, questionnaire saying, hey, thanks for your resume. By the way, the next step for us is answer these questions. And these are open-ended questions. Uh, what's the three most important things to you in your life? Um, how would a stranger, uh, total stranger describe you after meeting you for the first time? Okay. Neat. How do your best friends, you know, how would your best friends describe you if I called them? You know, what would they say about you? Uh, you know, obviously, because we're in a tech business, uh, what's the toughest technical challenge you've had? And, how, you know, describe that and, and how you resolved it. Uh, mm -hmm. We asked them about uh, maybe a, uh, a situation that, uh, an uncomfortable situation they've been in, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with an angry person or, or something, and how did they resolve you know, a dispute or whatever, some of those kinds of uh, kinds of questions. Then there's the typical, you know, salary requirements yeah. and, uh, you know, long-term, short-term goals and some of those things. So really, we don't talk to them unless we like the answers. You know, if all we mm -hmm. get on those answers is a grunt, like <laughs> yeah, pretty much the, the resume goes in file 13, right? So we want to really try and look into the, who are you as a person mm. as much as you can by answering these 15 questions, right? Let us know something about you more than I'm the greatest tech in the world and I only yeah. want a hundred grand to work for you. You know, like that's mm -hmm. honestly some of the, you know, one of the questions we have is what's your salary expectation? And we ask that because I don't want to waste their time. Yeah. You know, if they say I want $150,000, I, I, me as an employer, I can't pay them $150,000 for the position. So I just like decline, right? Yeah. So yeah. just, and a lot of the times you'll get the answer like, well, Happy to discuss this in person. Yeah, I would too. But in order yeah. for you to get in person, you got to answer the question, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, some things like that. So that's our process. We like the answers. We come come in for a few interviews. We mm. ask them all kinds of questions, from technical to um, again reverberate uh, some of the other questions we've talked about, depending on their answers. And um, recently, uh, I'm involved in a. Uh, I like leadership, teaching leadership, and. Uh, we basically uh, recently read a book and, um, uh-oh, what's it called? Do you remember? Anyway, it's the, um, oh shoot, I'm gonna have to come back. Anyway, I read this book. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a book, uh, it's the first 130 pages of fable and the last 130 pages of applying 
these three things to your life. Are you smart, hungry, humble, or smart? What's the book called? I can't remember. It's a, anyway, it's a great book. I'll try, I'll remember it. So we ask our, these, our, our interviewees, like, of these three words, what two would you use to most describe yourself? Hungry, humble, and smart. So hungry is the ability and the desire to, like, work, obviously, and, and, and you know, promote the company values and, and do their job and all that. Humble is I'm not the smartest person in the world. Or I am the smartest person, depending. And both those answers, you know, might demonstrate humility, right? Well, we might ask them, who's the smartest person in the room? Well, I am. Like, well, that's not very humble, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, people that are humble think if they're meek and mild, they're humble. But they are also cannot be humble because they're not recognizing that they have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. So so we dig into that a little bit and... and uh, so just some of the things I've read in different books, some of the different things I've learned, we kind of apply it to the interview. Quite often we'll do multiple interviews, two, two interviews probably, and, mm. and kind of figure out who is this guy or this lady and will they fit with who we, who we are and who we want to be and who, you know, they have the skill set to, mm. to help us, right? Mm. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> It's a good book. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Who's the author? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Anyway, it's a great book. I recommend it if you if you uh, have a team. It's a Patrick Lencioni. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, good book if you're raising a team, for sure. Thank you, Steve. Now we've we've kind of gone done this a little bit in reverse. Let's tell us the story about how. You got to this point of, of owning and running this this great IT company that you have. We didn't we didn't okay. actually All get right. to that. So so you're working in Vancouver for yeah. Ballard Power Systems. Ballard yeah. Power Systems. And what year is this about? Two oh four. Two oh four. Yeah. Okay. Now, so what happens while you're after after <laughs> while while you're working there and what happens? Anybody know the history afterwards? of Ballard Power Systems? Know anybody that's ever worked there? That's a book in itself. But um basically uh I worked there for a year as a contractor, two years as an employee, went to work one day and got called into the meeting and was given my pink slip. So that was, that's the short version of the story. Uh, you know, when you work in the city and live in Chilliwack, you usually commute with people. So I said, well, okay, great. You know, I need to ride home because I commuted with somebody today. Great, we'll get you a taxi. I live in Chilliwack. Like three, three faces on the other side of the day were like, hmm. All right, so they got me a taxi from Burnaby to Chilliwack, right? 225 bucks in, in 2004 dollars. I have no idea what it would cost now. The driver of the taxi had been in Canada three weeks and he barely spoke English. So I said, we're going to Chilliwack, you know what it is. Oh. Okay, I'll show you. Left, right, right, right. Got him to Chilliwack, dropped me off at my car, Lickman Road. I said, do you know how to get home? He's like, no. <laughs> he said, I got the radio. Okay, see ya. So yeah, as far as I know, he could still be driving around there. I, 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 I have no idea. Anyway, I send him on his way. So, um, so I, you know, uh, I don't know if anybody has commuted for a long period of time from Chilliwack into the city. It just becomes a lifestyle of getting enough rest so you can do it again. Is really what it comes to. You know, your routine mm -hmm. is you work, you come home, you eat dinner, bounce the kids on your knee, kiss your wife goodnight, go to bed, get up, do it again. That's that's really what your whole life becomes about. And what I was doing is the years when they were doing the first widening of the Portman Bridge. So that was like H-E double hockey sticks on the highway f through those years. And uh, so we had actually been wanting a change. And, uh, you know, uh, again, my, my good wife, I came home and she was working in a home office as a, a medical transcriptionist. So I came home about 11.30 and she said, what are you doing home? I said, I lost my job. She's like, praise the Lord. <laughs> that was her actual, her actual thing because like we were trying to figure out how do you get out of what you're doing, right? Like I'm not a quitter. Yeah. I would never want to just quit for the sake of quitting and hope that something else is going to show up, right? So, you know, you look for another opportunity and you promote yourself, right? That's more. So, so this, this was a different, 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 windshield event it was it was yeah right. yeah again <laughs> so this is, you know I, the accident got me into it this yeah. accident got me into uh, a place where i had to uh you know figure out what i was going to do with my life i got I had some severance and all that so I, had, yeah. I was okay for a while and i actually went back into the construction world for a little while just 
because there was an opportunity. And uh -huh. we went to a conference one time and, um, you know, I'd been in the IT world about 15 years at this time. Yeah. Went to this conference and this guy was speaking and he told a story uh, out of the Bible about uh, how Jesus had to pay his taxes. And he said, he, you know, this as the story goes, he sent a fisherman to get him a fish and there he found a coin in the mouth and whatever. So his whole point was like, did you realize he just didn't pick a fisherman? He actually picked the right fisherman. And the point of his story was, whatever you're meant to do, that's what you should do. And that's how I took it. It's like, I've been in IT for 15 years. I'm considering walking away from that in a totally different direction. Mm. And it really prompted me to like, when I came home from, from that conference, I actually went and got business cards printed and basically just started banging doors. Can I fix your computer? Can I fix you? Like, can I, you literally know, banging doors. Literally banging the doors, walking the streets uh, in, you know, through the business areas of Chilliwack uh, and, and just trying to, to, you know, get something going to feed my family. So I did that for about a, a year. 2005 around then? Uh, through from uh, August 2004 to okay. about September, October 2005. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we survived for that year. And uh, and then Imperion, the history of Imperion Technologies actually was started by a guy by the name of Greg Shaw. Mm -hmm. And he started it to pay his way through university. So he's just a kid going to UFE, taking a computer science thing, and he's like working on the side to pay his bills basically. And he, uh, he approached us uh, in the, the fall of 05 and said, you know, I've been working on uh, becoming a financial planner and I'm gonna give him my company, do you want it? Mm. It, was, it was basically the conversation. It's like, uh, gee, I don't know. I never thought of it being, mm. you know, obviously I'm out banging doors, trying to feed my family. You know, we had a discussion around that. And in November of 2005, we basically took it over. So we went from being solo entrepreneur to having, um, Two and a half employees, I guess. Okay. In in okay. the period of about two months, yeah. So. So tell us about the joy of cold calling and knocking on doors. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the, the story is a great one because it's it's you were you were essentially you had to do something, right? No, I, you abso had a family, absolutely. Right? Yeah, you yeah. had to do something, and you started yeah. knocking on doors and yeah, for sure. The first client or two. How? how, how yeah. Did that. Uh, okay. How did that happen? Sure. Well, I just uh, basically. Um, you know, uh, would just dread getting out of bed. I said earlier, you know, sometimes you just got to get out of bed. You know, when you have a, a wife pushing you out of bed, like you got to get out of bed, right? So <laughs> I, I hated cold calling and anybody who's done it, like it's, there's obviously a comfort level and a skill and all those things that you learn about doing, but I used to hate doing it. And I would just, you know, some days you know, before we owned Imperium, it would be like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she's like, well, just go out and start banging doors. And I got to the point where I decided that Okay, I'm gonna go knock on four. I'm gonna make four four cold calls. Yeah, I hype myself up enough to do four cold call. Four cold calls. First one would always be a no. Second one would be a maybe. The third one would be call me in two weeks. And the fourth one, you know, and all it would really take is like a yes, right? So anybody who's been in the sales world, one yes, like oh man, I've gone to heaven, right? I'm I'm floating 20 feet above the ground. I got a I got a, a yes maybe. Like you know that would really get you pumped. So. Small victories like that really would just, yeah. you know, again, my wife uh, would, you know, encourage me like, you got to go do it. And every time I did it, it got easier and easier and easier and easier. Mm -hmm. So um, one of my longtime clients is Home Life Property Ma or Home Life Realty and Home, Home Life Property Management. This is my first client that I actually cold called and, and actually got as a client. Hmm. And so that's, uh, that's 12, 12, 13 years, right? So went there, introduced myself, had a car, a little flyer. They said, oh, we got a computer guy, but you know, whatever. I said, well, you know, uh, if you call me, I'll be here within an hour. And this, uh, they said, really? You know what, the guy that we have now, we've called him two weeks ago and he hasn't even returned the call. And this became, over time, this was actually a very common thing that I discovered is that mm -hmm. like people do not return calls. So I think it was like the next day or the day after they phoned. I was still in my underwear at my computer checking my email. They phoned and said, you said if we called you, you'd be there in an hour. And I said, oh, yes, I did. And, uh, you know, if you let me just finish up what I'm doing right now, I'll be there in half an hour. How would that be? Are you, are you serious to be here in half an hour? Yes, I'll be there in half an hour. So that was my first client that I actually got. I got dressed, showered, ran down there, fixed the problem. And, uh, you know, we've had a great relationship ever since, you know, so. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. So a few, few of those like that, similar. We had another real, real estate company, exact same story. Interestingly enough, they had the exact same tech. We had also not <laughs> called them in the last two weeks. So I ended up having the, them as a client for, I want to say around uh, eight or nine years or something like that. So, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. 
And so you meet this fellow, Greg Shaw. Yeah. Had, had you known him previous? I knew that? him as a kid. He was quite a bit younger than I was. Okay. So, yeah, he, uh, you know, we attend this church. He attends this church. We were in this environment, so we okay. know each other from that perspective. And okay. uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, he offered us his company. We took it over and, you know, we uh, we jumped in both feet. Uh, first time out of a home office in a, in a, a, a real office, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Had to get up and actually go to work in the morning. And if you don't mind me to ask, did you did you have to acquire it financially, or was yes. it just kind of a here you are? No, no, we okay. we acquired it financially. Okay. Over time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So that was the fall of '05. In in early 2006, we actually so we had you know my little group of clients. We had the Imperion clients that they became Imperion in November of of '05. In early 06, a couple other small companies in Chilliwack, a couple solo mm -hmm. guys that were moving on to other things they actually gave us their customers. So we had gained another set of 25 or 30 customers, another wow. set of 25 or 30 customers. So from November till about March, we basically took the client base of four companies and put them together. Tremendous. So, What a great story. That's a great, great story. And uh, a great story of perseverance, getting out of bed, knocking on doors, led to that. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a challenge, for yeah. especially solo guys that work on their own with, outside of a normal structure, right? An office yeah. structure is like, okay, I'm in charge. I'm the everything guy here. You know, how do I, how do I make something of this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely a challenge. It helps to be married to have somebody. Well, push for you sure. Yeah. <laughs> Cold feet on the back in the morning gets you going, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, that certainly helps. Well, that's, that's a great story, um, Steve. Now, you did you, clearly. You 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 were in the right place. You clearly you had some great relationships with people who approached you because sure. they had they had clients that w needed looking after, and they were by the sounds of it moving out of the business in one way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in, in all cases. Yeah. Well, is there anything you can attribute to other than just acquiring businesses? I'm sure there are other things you attribute to your growth. So what what has made Imperian Technology, one of the 100 fastest growing companies in BC. Well, that story is a bit skewed, I think, because oh, somehow they okay. got a hold of our numbers and based on just on the numbers, you know, they oh, okay. they, they put us in that article. So okay. I'm not 100% sure how they got our numbers, but they got our numbers. And, um, but you're doing well. We're doing okay. Yeah, yeah, we're doing good. So, you know, we've, uh, I mean, I think, you know, as a company, we have some, you know, core values. You know, obviously hiring good people is has helped a lot. Functioning with them, what we, what we you know have our core values uh, has been has been really uh, one thing, and, and making sure our staff does as well. Mm. Um, you know, uh, doing what you say and say what you're going to do, like living by the golden rule, I guess is another way of putting it. Yeah. Has, has really been uh, uh, a thing that I think has helped. Uh, you know, just being the integrity of doing and and offering and providing what you say you're going to pro provide. I think. You know, and, and being able to do it over and over and over again. I mm. think it's just built over year, the years. You know, our reputation has grown. We've grown as a company as we've brought on more staff and, and more customers. Uh, you know, we've, you know, gained bigger and bigger and bigger customers all the yeah. time, which then has led to referrals of other bigger and bigger customers. So mm -hmm. I think really, you know, if I put it in a nutshell, it's like we have found a way to, I'll just say mostly, Live our values and live what we, how we want to portray ourselves in the community. You know, yeah. all the things. You know, and we've managed to do that not only individually but with our staff. Yeah, having and that's that goes back to hiring the right people, hiring people that think the same way you do, or being able mm -hmm. to thrive in that you know, the same kind of culture and mindset ab about business. And all our guys that, that and girls, we have girls too. You know, they really have the desire to provide the best service. That's on an honest goal. If I look at all of them, like that's that's what, what we're all about, right? So mm. we've we've gained a culture or built a culture that that, you know, when people can thrive in it, it just rubs off on everything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now honestly, I have customers I've never met, right? Mm. I've never talked to on the phone. I've seen an email or something. That's about it. And uh it might seem kind of weird because but at the same time, I, I know our team's doing a great job because we have, you know, as I've taken things off my plate, promoted people into those positions to to do functions within the company, mm -hmm. they've in turn maintained those long-term relationships and yeah. and and mm -hmm. and you know so 
that's something we've tried to do from the beginning is that when we build our company, it's not about us. You know, there's so many companies they build and it's the, I'll just pick on Ryan. It's the Ryan Johnson company. And if Ryan Johnson, you know, were to leave, then like people may or may not necessarily follow him. So we've tried to purposely build a company that people want to stick with. So when we're ready to go, whenever that mm -hmm. is, as we get older, whether we, you know, hand it over to our employees or sell it or whatever we do, yeah. that it can still thrive because we've taken on these employees. We, we, we feel like they're our family. We don't want to just walk away and have the whole thing implode and, yeah. and they then be lot, lot left high and dry and all those kinds of things. So there's are considerations when we think about how we build, you know, the, what the future might look like, all those things, making sure that Empyrean as an entity can thrive, whether Janine and I are there or not. And yeah. really it's been a purposeful activity, right? Mm. Get the right people, get them in the right people, in the right position, right seats on the bus, right? Positions in the right seats on the right bus, all, yeah, all those yeah, kinds of ideas, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a tremendous story because from what I, I know of your business, you don't really have a have salespeople either, do you? We I do, mean, well, we do zero marketing and, and I'm the one and only salesperson really yeah. when it comes down to it. And mostly. It's amazing. I, yeah. Yeah. Tremendous growth. Now, having said all of that, is there, can you think of uh, one or two or maybe more things you might have done differently? Along the way, uh, yeah, there are there are a few. I think you know, um, I'm pretty cautious as far you know as moving forward to doing you know. I don't just like get an idea and the next day we're doing it. I, I'm pretty you know analytical that way, looking at things and trying to figure out you know. So there's probably some things that we did that we should have done sooner. Mm. Uh, I think of like developing written processes and procedures and whatever. It's way easier to do when you're a small company, right? Two or three people, this is the way we do it. Like now we're 20 and how do you get 20 people moving in the same direction on the yeah. same issue, right? It's really difficult. So, you know, um, building maybe some of the systems that we use internally to manage our business, we maybe mm. should have done that differently. You know, there's there's lessons there, but some, some of those lessons you can only learn by doing it wrong once too, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, for, for sure that, um, I think, uh, you know, the whole idea of as a business owner, getting things off your plate, there's probably a few of them I could have done sooner. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's what I'm still doing that I'd love to get off my plate. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of those kinds of things, I think, and it's challenging because as your company grows, there's pressures on that side, right? You yeah. hire employees and office space and, you know, meeting customer needs and all those things. And yet there's all these underlying systems within your business that if you build them properly from a smaller mm -hmm. level, just, I think it just make, would have made life a whole lot easier for yeah. lot, lots of levels. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Wonderful, Steve. Now I know you, you and Janine have done very, very well and you're uh, uh, entrenched in the, in the Eastern Fraser Valley as being the kind of the go-to IT company. It's, it's, it's a great story now. Um, here we are in Chilliwack, yeah. and I know that you are um, involved in a number of different things. Sure. You're very passionate about leadership. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who live here in yeah. Chilliwack, do business in Chilliwack perhaps, or okay. even if we just live here and do business somewhere else, what sort of uh, ideas do you have in terms of how we might become perhaps better leaders or improve our leadership skills? Well, being here in Chile. Okay. Uh, I think there's a, a few things that come to mind. I mean, obviously some of these might sound like Pat saying, but leaders are readers. So read books, read lots of books, lots of ideas. Um, I think that, you know, for me as a business owner, the struggle has always been that I can only learn so much from a solo entrepreneur. So trying to find like-minded, like-sized companies that I can learn something from people that are maybe mm -hmm going through the similar struggles of running a business, that, yeah. that's yeah. One, one thing that uh, I think would be real, a really important thing to try and find like-minded, like-size yeah. companies similar and like, you know, be able to share ideas, um, mind share, so to speak. Doesn't necessarily have to be the same kind of business, but yeah. I think the same size is important because the struggles uh, will be similar. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, get involved with the community, I think is, is a big one. Um, you know, we, we run uh, leadership events because as a business owner, I want the people who work to me for me to be better leaders, but also goes beyond that. I mean, I think that Chilliwack's given us as a, a family and, and obviously a business a lot. So how can we give back to the community? And this is for us one way we do that, you know, aside from our business is, you know, 
bring these leadership events to town and mm -hmm. and and helping to help other leaders to become better leaders. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you tell us about the upcoming leadership event that uh, okay. you're involved with? Sure. So uh, I'm part of uh, an event called Live to Lead. It's November second. It's a rebroadcast of a live event which is actually happening October sixth. Uh, it's John Maxwell. It's a John Maxwell event. So it's John Maxwell. Um, there's a football player on there. Dave Ramsey, who's a financial peace university guy. Um, Cheryl Bachelor, who is, I think, a retail or restaurant CEO or something like that. Uh, so those will all be a video replay from the event. And then we have David Bentel from the Bentel Group in Vancouver. He's actually going to come out mm -hmm. uh, and speak live for about an hour. And I don't know if any of you know about the Bentel story. You've probably heard of the Bentel name if you've lived in the area. But the Bentel story is that his uncle and his dad built this empire it was worth six billion dollars. They got to the point where they wanted to split the company, but they had no plan. And the long and short of it is actually that they lost it. They lost a six billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. So that's his life story. Uh, he now works as an uh, as an advisor, helping companies position themselves, position their family business uh, for the future. So it's called. Mm -hmm. He has a book called Fireproofing Your Family Business. He's going to speak about that and. I think his topic is like never quit or something. But anyway, really good mm -hmm. local event. There's right now we have about 100 tickets sold and uh, we're trying to, you know, go to 300. So uh, those tickets are available. If uh, you said, shoot me an email, it's a really good event. We've done yeah. that one. This second year we've done it. We pre previous that we did a different one, but similar great. idea, leadership development. Wonderful. Yeah, it's a great event. I'm going. I know a few other, a few other folks here are going. So you can Where send Steve. It's actually going to take actually place right, right here. Here, yeah. So you can send me an email if you want, or send Steve an email, and I'll get you the information for it. So thank you very much, Steve. That's it? We're done? Well, well no, no, quite. We're not letting you okay. go yet. Okay. Somebody here might have a question or okay. two for Steve. Check. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of little bit of Q&A. &A, and uh, does anybody have any questions for Steve? Yes, Steve. Oh, yeah. Steve to Steve. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I've got two questions. For okay. <clears throat> One is an implied the way you were speaking is, I'm letting go. I have to let go of things to yeah. grow the business. Yeah. And you talk about it as all as if it's really simple to do. And I'm, I'm it's not really yeah, simple to go. Really How do you let go? That's my first question. Okay. And my second question is, what's your aspiration, your long term long term aspiration for, for the business? Okay. Uh, so how do you let go? That's a really hard one because you know if you're an entrepreneur, do you know that like. You want to do everything, right? And you want to do it your way and you want to make sure it gets done the way you want it done. And those those are hard things, right? Because especially with a growing business, like you may have done this certain function for, let's say, two years or three years or whatever. And your business grows to the point where, hey, I used to do the book, the, the invoicing, right? It just got to the point where this is crazy. Why am I doing the invoicing? I made her quit her job and she had to come and start doing the invoicing, right? That was an easy one because I hated doing it. But so some of them are are easy to get get rid of because it's just like it just makes sense. So I asked myself this question: What is the best value for me in running my company? Is it doing invoicing? Is it doing sales? Is it um, you know ordering stuff? Like like what is it? Right. So I look at it from the perspective of you know what's the best value? What is my time worth the most to the company for? And I think it's a challenge for entrepreneurs because like they just want to do it, right? Like mm. maybe they got into business and they love woodworking and they just want to be the guy out in the shop building the wood thing, whatever it is, right? But really they need to learn to run the business, do the take care of the business side and uh, you know, release some of those other things and trust other people. So part of it for me is just really again having somebody to number one, fulfill that role. So again, our culture, we hire our culture. So I'd like to say that, you know, mentally and, and, and like the way that people think about business, pretty much anybody in our team is gonna at some point be asked to do more, right? So what is that more? And it'll depend by individual, right? So, you know, uh, when we had seven or eight techs, and I got to the point, it's like, I just cannot be managing all the techs and making sure they're doing all their stuff. and. Mm answering their phone calls and filling out their notes and like all that stuff. Like it's just a lot of stuff, right? It just became too much. So who do I have on my team that, you know, makes the next logical sense or who's the next mm -hmm. two or three on my team that makes the next logical sense. 
And I just gave one of them the chance to do it. Like, hey, I want you to be the service manager. This is your responsibilities. You know, let's t and over time that developed and it developed into more and more and let him fail and, you know, and correct and let him fail and correct and steer and, and whatever. So I think it's just a process that you have to go through to, you know, maybe you don't do it right the perfect the first time, but really I think it's about finding people on your team that, make the most sense because they maybe they know the most about that area or they've been there the longest functioning in that area maybe they don't know all the answers but but not everybody at the same time not everybody can be a manager per se but you can still mm -hmm. offload tasks or work to people that are capable of doing it right it's not easy i wasn't implying it was easy i think it's really hard because they can screw something up really bad right if it's the wrong person right so mm -hmm. that's why i think that part goes back to making sure you have the right people right the the, the right mentality, the right people that are functioning on the team as a team member, fulfilling your 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 goals and values and all those things already, right? So the last thing you want to do is promote an idiot, right? I guess the last thing you want to do is hire an idiot. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> and then his, his second question. Second question was? Aspiration. So what, what's, your, what's your aspiration? Well, for, okay. For the business? Perhaps you you know, I, for a few, year, few years, I've always told people that ask me that I want to be the king of the castle. So I wanted to be the biggest IT guy in this end of the valley, uh, providing the best service, the, being the most sought after, whatever. I think I backed off a little bit on that just because I know, especially in the last uh, year and a bit, I think we've added like nine bodies to our staff. It's like, holy cow, like, can, is, how big is big enough? That's, that's actually the question I'm asking myself now. Is how big is big enough? Like, is there a point where uh, it, it's big enough? It's enough, or is it? A, or do you take it and uh, try and blow up the world and 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 go beyond that? So that's kind of my my current mindset: is how big is big enough? We've got you know ideas about expanding further, obviously, and, and things like that. The struggle is people, again, because we're pr pretty particular about who we hire and how do you find them and. I think I said, you know, we, we hired recently, we went through 58 people and didn't hire any of them, you know? Uh, so it's a bit of a struggle, like, especially with the pressure of the Vancouver market, right? So, you know, that that's... Uh, so five years from now? Five years from now. Uh, I think that I'll be spending less time in the office. That That's a, a definite goal. Um, I mean, I may not look as old as I am, but I'm, I'm hitting 60 pretty soon, so... Uh, you know, in the next five years, I want to get to that point where, you know, we can let other people run the company probably and uh, mm -hmm. have less hands-on, so to speak, and do some other things that we're passionate about. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you have an exit strategy? Not yet. Uh, we've, you know, we're kind of early on that from the perspective of, uh, you know, we're both young-hearted like we're active, you know, my dad's 94 and he's still going, I'm going to be that guy, right? So, you know, the idea of retirement really for me is not really the idea of like, I'm going to quit work and whatever. So I think we're we'll always be involved doing something. You know, we've, we're at kind of the stage where we're, we're seeing it's, it's on the horizon somewhere down there. So we've talked about it, but we don't, we're not there yet. We're not even really to the point where like, hey, let's do it next year. We're kind of like, you know, Maybe when we hit 65 or maybe 70 or who knows, right? Mm. You're clearly enjoying yourselves then. So it's not something you feel like you got to do next month or Oh, no. I think year. for the yeah. most part, we're still having a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. there's obviously like every business there's days, like it's not much fun. But, mm. you know, I, to be honest, right? Like, you know, there, everybody has those days where it's like, man, I just can't wait till this day's over. So mm -hmm. we get those days too. But, yeah, we're having a lot of fun. The amazing part is I work full time with my wife and I don't know if mm. anybody's done that. And that's an interesting dynamic to learn because, you know, right, you're, you're partners. And yet when we first started working together, it's like, you know, we would have discussions like, I really didn't like the way you asked me to do that today, you know, or, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know. So you're learning to work together like on a level. She, you know, she's the chief financial officer right there. She pays my paycheck. I got to be nice to her, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, learning to work together, yeah. like yeah. I mean, we're pretty much together, like 23 and a half out of 24 hours, probably most days. And, mm. you know, we, we cycle together. We do a lot of stuff together. We work together, yeah. we sleep together. Like, you know, 
it's a lot of together. So that's a, a, a an interesting thing we've learned to do over time as well. You know, yeah. you know. it's tremendous, tremendous. One more, one last question. Sam, right, we got what, two questions. So yeah, go ahead, Fred. Go ahead, Sam. What, what's your process? You know, that's a really good question. I think, you know, you see natural ability and talents in people as you're working with them over time, right? Obviously, uh, you know, you see, you know, she likes numbers. You see how she likes, you know, I, she has an ability with numbers. You know, you should, do, maybe we should let you do the books, right? That's kind of how it came, came about. So other people, it's just, I think, observation. Like, honestly, Aside from the people we've hired in the last year, we have like long-term employees. We have the a little bit of the luxury of looking back at the ones that might be suggested as the next in line for, to do something different. Like we have a long history with them already. So we know them on a personal level. We know them on a work level. We know everything about them pretty, you know, a lot of them already. So I think that time is a, is a good proving ground. Mm. And again, I said earlier, we're pretty slow to make change. So it's not like, hey, I need a, I need a sales manager. Hey, it's you. I'm not, that would never happen, right? You know, that we'd have to figure that out. So I don't really have a, a solid answer other than that. Okay. John. Looking back, we should have, but would you have been able to? Like, see, I look at it now, realize I should have. Yeah. But when I was small, I didn't realize how much it would affect you now. Yeah. Yeah. I, absolutely. This position, yeah. Right? So yeah. As much as you say you made that, you would have changed that. Would you have changed? I guess in asking the question, maybe without actually answering it for you, probably the fact that you said hanging around with people who are in similar situations probably could have helped that a bit, but I would think so. Yeah. I'll let you answer it. <laughs> yeah, no, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Like we didn't know we were just, we were just young and foolish and trying to go and build the business and grow and hire another body and, you know, pay the bills and, and all those kinds of things. But I do think that there was probably, I know in my mind, there was probably a time when a switch went on, like that said, like, Hey, we got to start writing some of this down. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was imperfect and whatever, but at the same time, you know, uh, you did your best, obviously. I did my best. If I had a hindsight, I would have done it differently, absolutely, because now it's an absolute struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it really answers the question, but we don't have, we, you know, we have, we have the, the, the privilege of hindsight now. I would say the same thing, that it, that it, was, it is a lot easier now that you see it that you should have done it. Yeah. Being able to have said that, yeah, just the idea of, uh, of documentation. I mean, I have a T-shirt says I love documentation. And I wear it once in a while, and and I really don't love documentation from the perspective of writing it or even reading it because it's just terrible. But it's a necessary evil, right, in our business because you know I've got I've got fifteen hundred clients in my database, and I've got fourteen guys to deal with them. So. The chance that if you're my client and you phone for help, one of those 14 has to help you, and they're not going to remember every little minutia about every little setting in your system. So for us, documentation is like an absolute necessity, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, when we're quiet, which is not very often, like our guys, like their tasks, like, what am I doing today? You're writing documentation. These three clients are yours. Document everything. Uh, yeah, it's like pulling teeth, right? But at the same time, it's so important. I, if somebody asked me was starting business, that would be the, the number one thing I think I'd put on their list. Right, write everything down, some form at right at least, so so yeah. it's accessible for the future, right? Yeah. Great. Yeah. 
great advice. Well, Steve, we've been we've been at it an hour, and you've been tremendous. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. Let's give Steve's check out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you for. You know, I'm humbled actually that you'd, you'd asked me, but thank you very much. Oh, and great. Uh, thank you very you much. You made it Steve. easy to answer the questions, and you, it didn't hurt nearly as much as you said it was going to. So, uh, thanks. Very good. Right on. All thanks right. very much for coming out, everybody.